Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us at the Free Library of Philadelphia at Home. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. Before we begin tonight's presentation, I want to point out a couple of useful features on your screen. You'll notice there's a button below that suggests you buy a copy of our guest's new book, The Sun and Her Stars. The button links to the website of the Joseph Fox Bookshop. I know they will be happy to send a copy to you anywhere in the country. On screen, you'll also see the Ask a Question link, which you can use to ask a question, suggest a topic, or upvote a question that you like. And I encourage you to start asking questions as soon as possible. There's also a donation link that you can use to support our online author events, and we want to keep the series running, and we welcome your support. Without knowing so, you've probably read one of Donna Rifkin's many book reviews in the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the Times Literary Supplement over the years. Her reviews have won praise, and she was named a finalist for the Distinguished Nona Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing from the National Book Critics Circle. Rifkin's new book, The Sun and Her Stars, considers the life of Salpa Virtel, the unheralded Jewish expat actress, screenwriter, and Garbo confidant, who created a Hollywood haven for scores of European emigres who had escaped the horrors of Nazi Germany including Katja and Thomas Mann, Arnold Schoenberg, and Bertolt Brecht, among many others. A reviewer in the Wall Street Journal describes the book as a brilliant idea and a feat of daunting research, moving, mournful, and passionately written. Donna, welcome. The screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Andy, for that kind introduction. And I do want to take a second to uh, be grateful for libraries and for the Free Library of Philadelphia because every time I'm hosted by a library, I'm reminded that we're very lucky to have these intentional communities in our midst where they are free and open to everyone. Because many of the people that I write about in my book had their personal libraries taken away from them. Uh, their own books were heaped on bonfires in May of 1933 by the Nazis. Um, they did not have the kind of free and open society that we have today. And so just a moment of gratefulness for that. Um, the, uh, I'm gonna read a little bit from my book, but first I wanted to just talk about um, a bit about how I came to write it. Um, so my subject is Salka Fiertel. She was um, the son of my title. And uh, I had never heard of her when I, um, came across her. If you are in the film world, you have you know her quite well, but most people in the country uh, don't know who she is, and I certainly did not. Um, and my goal, once I found out about her and how important her contribution was to not just Hollywood, but to um, the history of anti-fascism in America, uh, was to write her back into history, because I think she has been unfairly ignored. Um, I was reading a quote from Margaret Atwood today where she said that um, history is, uh, uh, part, part of it is, is the history that we write, but a great part of history is the history that has not been written. So that's, that was an important mission for me. Um, so she's the son of my title. The stars are actual superstar uh, German speaking intellectuals, writers, film folk composers, physicists, uh, mostly Jews, all anti-fascists who found, as I said, their libraries stolen from them, their homes stolen from them, their books burned. Um, and this was uh, less than 100 years ago, this was happening. It's so we think of it, you know, the 1930s and the 1940s as ancient history, but it really wasn't that long ago. Um, and long before this was happening to them, um, the great writer Heinrich Heine had predicted that where they burn books, in the end, they will also burn human beings. And he wrote that in 1823, and he had um, quite a bit of foresight there. So uh, just a bit about how I came to write the book. I um, am a native of Los Angeles, and when I was growing up, I was pretty much taught that L.A., um, is a cultural wasteland, that nothing of any value, cultural value ever happens here. Um, I certainly had no idea that um, in this time in history, um, 
the greatest sort of intellectuals of Europe had landed in Los Angeles and um, were producing their novels and their music and their plays. Um, if I had known that, I think I would have connected more to my hometown. Um, I spent a long time away from it. And when I came back, I became a little more interested in Los Angeles history. And I went to the library and I came across a memoir that had been recommended to me called The Kindness of Strangers, written by a woman named Salka Fiertel. And I read this book, which I have come, I have come to believe is really the best memoir ever written about Hollywood. And I said, who is this person? Why have I never heard of her? Why don't I know who she is? Um, she was such a vibrant personality. Her life was so momentous. She uh, was a huge influential figure in Hollywood. If she didn't have actual power, she certainly had influence. And she was a major figure in Los Angeles in the, the anti-fascist movement uh, during the war. So why isn't she better known? Um, and as I started to read more, uh, uh, try to find out more about her, I would see her in footnotes of other people's memoirs and their letters and their biographies, but not so much about her. So I decided that I would um, take a look and see how I could find out more about her. And in fact, ended up spending nine years writing a book about her and about the people she knew. Um, it's estimated that there were about 10,000 German speaking immigrants who landed in the greater Los Angeles area in the decade after 1933, which is when Hitler strolled into the chancellorship in Germany. Um, many of them were in the film community and they were coming to Hollywood because there were jobs there. But just as many of them were not, they were, um, they found themselves in Los Angeles in a, a very exotic foreign environment, a place they never thought they would be. Um, most of them, as I said, were Jews, but many of them, and all of them were anti-fascist. They had run away from Hitler, footsteps ahead of the Nazis, and were lucky to have gotten out with their lives. Many of them had literally walked over the Pyrenees uh, from southern France to try to get a plane to Lisbon, to Spain, and then to Lisbon, and then to the United States. Um, so how did Salka Fiertel come to be a sort of den mother to all of these emigres? Um, she was a networker before there was such a thing as networks, and she was an activist before the word activist had ever been um, invented. She was born uh, in 1889 in a small garrison town in Galicia on the wheezing end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and she aspired to be an actress, and she, against her family's wishes, did become quite an accomplished actress. She was um, involved in a theater group with her husband Berthold in Berlin uh, in the 1920s called Die Truppe. And she acted also all over the, the stages uh, in Europe for Max Reinhardt's theaters in Vienna, in Dusseldorf, in uh, many, many European capitals. Um, she and her husband, uh, had this theater company that was in dire financial straits in 1928. And fortuitously, her husband Berthold, who was a poet and a theater director and quite an intellectual, uh, got an offer from Fox Film Corporation in Hollywood to come to be the writer for the uh, films of uh, F.W. Murnau. And so uh, this was 1928, this was well before the National Socialists took over, but there were already sort of signs of uh, anti-Semitism, very clear signs throughout Europe, and certainly in many of the cities that, in which Salka acted, she had, had noticed you know, that there was a rise of anti-Semitism. And so for many reasons, they thought, well, we can go to Hollywood for a little while and we can rebuild our finances and then we'll come back. And so, uh, that was their goal. They had three very young sons, and the idea of making such a momentous move was um, a little bit daunting to Salka. She barely knew who, where Hollywood was. Her father had to show it to her on a map. Um, but they arrived in Los Angeles in 1928, and uh, they settled in Santa Monica, um, which at the time was not a chic place to live. The movie people thought they were crazy to live there. They thought they would get rheumatism and all kinds of diseases if they lived by the ocean. It was not considered healthful in any way. 
to be there. But there they were in Santa Monica in a, uh, a very comfortable, cozy, not grand, not large house that had uh, a view of the ocean, which Salka loved. And uh, as time went on, Berthold um, did quite well. He uh, wrote several very big movies for uh, Murnau and he moved from Fox to Paramount, but he never uh, fit in perfectly into the studio system, which was then sort of gearing up to uh, get all its machinery going. He was an intellectual, a Viennese cafe intellectual, and Los Angeles baffled him in many ways. He never learned to drive. He uh, was sort of unclear about what they wanted from him at the studio. He was not a great uh, tac tactful negotiator when it came to trying to get his way. He would be more likely to quote Kierkegaard and run off to the bathroom and read Immanuel Kant. On the other hand, Salka did have many of those skills and she realized uh, that maybe there would be a place for her because she was no longer an actress, she was then 40 years old. Um, then as now, parts for women in Hollywood were few and far between at that age. And she was lucky enough in around 1929 at a party at Ernst Lubitsch's house to meet the actress Greta Garbo who was then at the height of her fame. She uh, was, had very successfully made the transition from the silent era to uh, talking pictures. And um, she and Salka hit it off in a way that was very, it had a very intense, close relationship that lasted really the, the rest of their lives. They each realized that the other had something that they did not, Garbo had, immense celebrity and a lot of power. She was the highest paid uh, star at MGM at the time. Salka, on the other hand, had diplomacy and uh, a way of negotiating that was very helpful to Garbo when she uh, needed a go-between between herself and the studio. So um, very much like other sort of collaborations in Hollywood among women, one of them uh, is Frances Marion, who uh, was a very prolific screenwriter and she worked with the actress Mary Pickford also very fruitfully for many years. Um, these were examples of women who um, complemented each other with their various skills in Hollywood. So um, Salka uh, gave up acting. She had actually acted in a few movies in Hollywood. She and Garbo appeared together in a German language version of Anna Christie um, which Garbo considered her finest role, actually, even though it was in German. And Salka really did not um, enjoy uh, acting in that movie. She said that acting in films was like drinking from an eyedropper when you're parched. So she, uh, Garbo suggested to her that maybe she might want to try her hand at screenwriting. And Garbo and uh, Salka had been reading a biography of uh, the 17th century queen Christina of Sweden, who was someone who was very close to Garbo's heart as a, a Swedish citizen. And Garbo suggested, well, why don't you try your hand at, at writing a treatment? So uh, Salka did, and she ended up uh, writing the movie Queen Christina, which I think is one of Garbo's greatest films. She wrote four other films for MGM, um, The Painted Veil, Anna Karenina, Conquest, and Two-Faced Woman. And she also wrote a Warner Brothers picture for Ida Lupino um, called Deep Valley. Um, and when Salka, who was a quite tireless, energetic person, wasn't spending long hours at the studio, she was um, a mother and a wife, but also a connector of people in Hollywood. She, from very early on, uh, was conducting Sunday afternoon parties at her house, and her circles of friends were. Uh, expanding every time. Um, she had a genius really for connecting people, for inviting them into her home, for um, setting up collaborations between talented people that she knew. And so the word sort of spread. She wasn't the only person who was holding what you might think of as salons in Hollywood, but she was certainly one of the better known. And as the European exiles started to stream into Los Angeles, uh, they found uh, a place at Salka Sunday afternoon parties where they could feel at home. Uh, the cooking smells were similar to their mother's 
you know, cooking, the books on the shelves were the same that had been on their shelves in Europe. They felt immediately that this was a refuge, a, a safe place for them, um, as well as a place where they might be able to meet people who could help them, you know, find, uh, restart their careers in Hollywood now that their um, film careers in Germany had been amputated. Um, and Salka herself was a fantastic hostess. She spoke eight languages. She was very funny. She was very flirty. She was incredibly confident. She was someone who you gravitate toward. And that's why I think I thought in my title to describe her somewhat as the sun. So I wanna give an example of, of how Salka was able to make connections between some of these emigres and uh, the Hollywood studio system by reading a bit from my book about Arnold Schoenberg, who Salga had known quite well in Europe because her brother Edward was a pianist who was a protege of Arnold Schoenberg's. And when, he, when Arnold Schoenberg was driven out of Europe in 1934 for producing what the Nazis called degenerate music and for being a Jew, he uh, found himself in uh, first on the East Coast and then uh, gravitated toward Los Angeles, which was better for the asthma that he suffered from. And he um, uh, be, uh, re reconnected with Salka and came to many of her Sunday afternoons where he enjoyed playing ping pong and um, mixing with the Hollywood crowd, including uh, George Gershwin, who became a very close friend of his. So I'm just gonna read a little bit uh, from my book about um, Schoenberg and Salka in the studio system at MGM. In November 1935, Salka took part in a now legendary encounter between American commercial culture and European high modernism in the Thalberg bungalow at Metro. At the time, Irving Thalberg was busy negotiating with Charles Boyer's people in Paris to secure the French actor for Garbo's Napoleon picture. He was also immersed in preparations for Metro's adaptation of Pearl S. Buck's blockbuster 1931 novel about China, The Good Earth. Thalberg had heard a New York Philharmonic radio concert that featured Arnold Schoenberg's early string sextet, Transfigured Night. He thought the music was pretty. Well aware of Salka's friendship with the composer, he asked her to arrange a conference with Schoenberg to see whether he might write the score for The Good Earth. In Salka's often repeated account, she set up the meeting, but first she went out of her way to educate each of the men about potential conflicts. She told Thalberg that Schoenberg had long ago abandoned the glittering tonality of transfigured night for the austerities of 12-tone technique, which she did not think Thalberg would like. For Schoenberg, who badly needed the money, she estimated that Metro might pay him as much as $25,000, a lordly sum, but warned of Thalberg's likely interference in every aspect of the composition. After much fussing over scheduling, the two men at last convened in Thalberg's office, along with Schoenberg's wife, Gertrude, and with Salka, whom Thalberg had asked to serve as translator. The titan of the second Viennese school leaned forward in his chair, clutched the umbrella he had refused to surrender, and trained his smoldering eyes on the last tycoon, who stood behind his desk and praised the composer's lovely music. I don't write lovely music, corrected Schoenberg. Thalberg changed course and explained that he was looking for Chinese-themed melodies to accompany scenes containing lots of action and not much dialogue. Schoenberg responded in surprisingly eloquent English that all film music was uniformly terrible and that he would not take on the project unless he had complete control over the sound, including all the actor's words, which must be uttered in the precise pitch and key he would compose for them. Thalberg was fascinated and asked Schoenberg to elaborate. Schoenberg turned to Salka and asked her to recite some verses from his landmark 1912 melodrama, Piero Lunaire, which features an expressionist technique called Sprechstimme, or spoken voice, that sounds like neither natural speech nor singing. Its closest counterparts might be the style of the French Dizeuse or early German cabaret. Gamely, Salka performed some of the work in its original German, using the correct swooping high and low tones and long and short holds. The wine we drink with our eyes pours down in waves nightly from the moon. Thalberg mused on this for a while and then remarked impassively that the Good Earth's director would most likely have contradictory ideas about the dialogue and would want to guide the actors himself. Schoenberg, unbothered, assured Thalberg that the director would be free to handle the actors as soon as they had perfected their lines with Schoenberg. 
Still fascinated, Thalberg sent the composer home with a copy of the screenplay and encouraged him to offer more suggestions. When he'd gone, Thalberg declared to Salka that Schoenberg would learn to capitulate and would write the music on the studio's terms, not Schoenberg's. She was doubtful. The next morning, Schoenberg's wife phoned Salka to let her know that Schoenberg was now asking for $50,000 for the complete control he would need over the film and its dialogue. At this, Thalberg shrugged, telling Salka that the studio had on hand some Chinese folk songs, which the sound department was using to write some very lovely music. Credit for the film's score went to the studio stalwart, Herbert Stoddart, who had served as the composer for Queen Christina. Schoenberg, who refused to write lovely music or to compromise on his radical notions about sound in film, was politely cast aside. It's an excellent story relayed in The Kindness of Strangers with Characteristic Self-Effacement by Salka, one of Metro's most literate and engaging storytellers. But self-effacement has its costs, for while the anecdote has been retold many times in different contexts, few bother to mention that Salka played a greater role here than merely recalling the episode. No doubt much would have been different here had she been a man, and certainly nobody bothered to ask for the perspective of Gertrude Schoenberg, who was also in the room. Surely she too would have had plenty to say. Salka's position as a cultural broker between the two men shows that Thalberg and Schoenberg, each often portrayed as a stubbornly independent genius, operated as everyone does within a network of connections without which they could not function. No one understood this network better or maneuvered through it more effectively than Salka. She was the mutual contact who first made it possible for the composer and the producer to meet. She was the diplomat with a firm grasp of the complexities of both milieus, who took the trouble to issue honest warnings about each man's expectations. She was the translator and the trained actress who was able to demonstrate Schoenberg's arcane techniques, doing what she could to make them accessible to Thalberg. She conveyed to Schoenberg what Thalberg felt entitled to receive from the composer in exchange for the studio's payment. She was the conduit here between two uncompromising sensibilities and without her mediating presence, it is very likely that there would have been no comprehension and perhaps no meeting whatsoever. Instead, after the two famous men had circled each other cautiously, each walked away with a respect for the other that came about completely through Salka's nuanced efforts. Then there is the fact that she recorded the story in her memoir, without which we would not have her amused and amusing account. It's noteworthy that even during a time of intense personal crisis, Salka was able to expand the mission she had begun with Eisenstein and Murnau, softening the boundaries between high culture and commerce in Hollywood for the potential benefit of each. That mission was becoming more urgent as the situation for Jewish artists in Europe worsened. Once, those artists had had a fatherland, but it was a dream. They were beginning to understand that far-flung outposts must be built to preserve the humanist traditions that the National Socialists were destroying in Germany. Salka was establishing one of those crucial outposts, easing the hardship for exiles such as Schoenberg, who struggled to make a living throughout his California years. In bringing Schoenberg to Metro, Salka was not just a fly on the wall of Thalberg's office as the two men tried to apprehend each other. She was a destroyer of walls, a builder of bridges, a welcome among strangers. I just wanna tell a little story that I really like a lot about that sort of uh, illustrates how many of these German speaking exiles uh, were in Los Angeles at the time that Salka was having her Sunday parties. And it's a story about the director Otto Preminger who is very well known for movies like Forever Amber and Laura and St. Joan. And um, Preminger what, found himself in a casino one night on Sunset Boulevard around this time um, that was frequented by European exiles. And he was at the roulette table and he started to become annoyed by the loud cacophonous Hungarian that was uh, being spoken all around him. And he uh, smashed his fist down on the green bays of the roulette table and he yelled, God damn it guys, we're in America, speak German. I love that story because uh, my publisher, who is of Hungarian extraction, thinks it's the funniest story she's ever heard, so I like to tell it um, for her specifically. Um, so just as all these people, everybody uh, uh, 
came to the Ricks in the movie Casablanca, um, everyone came to Salka's in Santa Monica, uh, including the entire cast and crew of Casablanca, uh, most of whom were emigres. The, um, the director, Michael Curtis, and the lead, one of the leading men, Paul Henry, um, they uh, found themselves, uh, you know, like I said, in, in a place of refuge at Salka's house. And um, the other thing that Salka did uh, was to uh, involve herself in many activist organizations that helped um, against the cause of anti-fascism in America and in Europe. And she uh, was a very active in um, Hollywood's own sort of grassroots anti-fascist organization, which was called the European Film Fund. And most of the emigres in Casablanca had come via the auspices of the European Film Fund, which raised money in order to collect affidavits for uh, emigres who needed to get out of Germany, uh, out of Europe, and to find them jobs once they um, landed in America. So what the, uh, the idea was that everyone in the film industry would give 1% of their weekly salary to, uh, toward this fundraising group, and then a uh, mountain of paperwork that was required to collect these affidavits and to get people out, uh, the money would be used for that. So Salka was extremely involved in the European Film Fund, gave a lot of her MGM, um, you know, uh, parts of her salary to it. And then later on, when she was less successful in Hollywood, actually became a beneficiary, as many of these people did, of the European Film Fund when she needed it. Um, so when people landed in Los Angeles, um, these, these European superstars, there was no guarantee that they were going to be successful in Los Angeles. And it's a quite a wide variety of people who, um, some of whom were very successful here and others were not at all. And I can illustrate that by telling a little bit about the brothers uh, Thomas and Heinrich Mann, who were both hugely popular international novelists in Germany. Heinrich possibly even more than Thomas Mann in Germany. Uh, Thomas Mann had won the Nobel Prize in 1929, he palled around with FDR in the White House. He got one uh, award and medal after another and was tremendously successful and productive during his time in the Pacific Palisades, not far from Salka's house, where he had built a house with his wife Katya. Um, his brother Heinrich, on the other hand, found his fortunes completely um, reversed. He uh, was uh, came to Los Angeles through the auspices of the European Film Fund and found himself almost uh, totally supported by them and by his brother Thomas. He had come with a year-long contract at Warner Brothers. That was one of the ways that the European Film Fund helped people get out because you had to prove that you were not going to be a public charge uh, when you came to America. So you had to prove that you had some means of employment. So the studios would give these year-long contracts um, to, you know, the people who needed to get out most, most um, direly. And so Heinrich Mann, who really um, didn't have much to do with the film business, was a bit baffled by it, would sort of show up at these Warner Brother offices, not quite sure what he was supposed to be doing there. And on the other hand, they didn't really know what to do with him either. So he really struggled during his time in Los Angeles. And um, Nobody really even remembers Heinrich Mann today, and he was a tremendously accomplished, talented novelist, which um, I sort of hope that somebody will undertake to translate his works and bring them um, to an English-speaking audience. Um, there were other collaborations in Salka's living room, one between the playwright Bertolt Brecht, her very good friend, and the actor Charles Lawton, the English actor. Um, the two of them did not speak each other's languages. Lawton did not speak German. Breck did not speak English, um, but they were able to converse in French because they both uh, knew French. And they um, collaborated on a, uh, a, a version of Breck's play Galileo, which they put on in 1947 in the Coronet Theater um, in the Fairfax district, which still exists today. And it was a huge emigre sort of um, uh, you know, glittery kind of evening when they when they put on this play. Um, Charlie Chaplin was there and all kinds of celebrities came. Um, 
There were also very, uh, a lot of British uh, film folk who came to Salka's. Christopher Isherwood was a special friend of hers. He for a time lived in the garage apartment above her garage. Um, Aldous Huxley, whom Salka collaborated with on a uh, film version of about the life of Marie Curie, which never saw the light of day, but sort of sparked their lifelong friendship. Um, and then there were composers. There were many, aside from Arnold Schoenberg, there was the composer Hans Eisler, who was the composer for many of Brecht's plays and, and some of his films. Um, Hans Eisler ca uh, came afoul of the um, HUAC hearings in 1948, when after the war, many of these emigres were suspected of being communists and were um, forced to testify under HUAC. Um, Eisler did testify and was deported in 1948. And I just want to read what his statement was when he was forced to leave Los Angeles, which a place he very much liked and um, had uh, felt comfortable in. He wrote, I could well understand it when in 1933, the Hitler bandits put a price on my head and drove me out. They were the evil of the period. I was proud at being driven out, but I feel heartbroken at being driven out of this beautiful country in this ridiculous way. And uh, when the war ended, many of um, the emigres who had come to Los Angeles ended up going back to Europe because they felt that the same winds of fascism that they had tried to escape in Germany were coming to uh, America on the heels of the HUAC hearings. Um, they did not like the way they saw the political situation changing and they understandably tra were traumatized by it and went back. Um, these people had lost so much. They had lost their careers in their heyday. They had lost family members. Uh, Salka herself during uh, the war lost one of her own dear family members in the Holocaust. Um, then she ended up uh, being not necessarily blacklisted during the McCarthy era, but what's called gray listed, which meant that she was no longer going to be offered any, any more jobs because of her left-leaning friends uh, and her associations. She was, her FBI file showed her to be um, far too sympathetic to known communists to get any more work. So she um, herself went back to Europe. She swore she would never go back to Germany or to Austria, but she went to Switzerland, which she saw as a sort of more sanitized version of Germany. And her son Peter had moved to the resort town of Closters with his second wife, Deborah Carr, and his uh, daughter, Christine, who is Salka's granddaughter, whom she was extremely close to. So Salka moved there in the early 1960s to be close to Christine and to Peter. And um, she wrote her wonderful memoir, The Kindness of Strangers, during those years in Closters. And uh, she died there in 1978. Um, Greta Garbo would come in the summers to hike with Salka in the hills in Switzerland. And even after Salka died, Garbo continued to go to Closters as sort of an homage to her, her dear friend, Salka. So I just want to wrap up a little bit by um, quoting Bertolt Brecht, who um, is sort of a well-known quote, but maybe you haven't heard it. And it gives, I think, a little bit of a perspective maybe to what people might be feeling in our own bewildering time. And Brecht wrote, in the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. And I think, you know, the story of Salka and her, her emigre, her exile friends, uh, can give us a little bit of a blueprint about how to sing in the dark times. Um, they were just as bewildered by circumstances during their time as we are in ours, but they managed to navigate through it with grace and with compassion and with empathy uh, all sorts of things that fascist and totalitarian governments try to stamp out um, in people. And that she exhibited what in Germany is called civil courage or moral courage um, to, to be able to help people who needed to be helped, to uh, not make everybody um, one, um, you know, sort of mass of humanity, but to see the, the uh, individuals for what they were and for what they might have needed. And so she is a great sort of, she's not a saintly person because nobody is really. Uh, I, try to, I try not to make her sound like a saint. She was driven by many of the same demons that 
a lot of us are, but but I found in her a real sort of role model of how to how to sing in the dark times. And um, I hope you will too if you read my book. And I'm going to throw it back to Andy now. I hope that's okay. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Hi, Donna. Thanks so much for that. Um, I have a question for you um, from one of the audience members. And this gentleman would like to know, were her grandchildren helpful with the letters or the memories? That's a great question. And yes, in fact, they were. There were n None of her three sons are living any longer. Two of her daughters-in-law are and were tremendously helpful to me, as were her grandchildren. And interestingly, because Salka was such a great connector, I found myself channeling her in a little bit of a way, although I myself am much more introverted, I was able to sort of reconnect people who had not seen each other since childhood. Um, uh, one of her very dear friends um, was the novelist Erwin Shaw, and his son Adam uh, was very helpful to me. He, he thought of Salka almost as a, grand, a grandmother figure. She um, when he, he grew up in Closters and she spent a lot of time with him and I was able to reconnect uh, Adam with uh, Vicki Schulberg who is Salka's step-granddaughter and also probably one of the people uh, uh, one of the people alive who know most about Salka uh, is Vicki and so they had not really um, connected with each other at all until uh, I had embarked on this project so that was sort of a, I, I sort of felt Salka smiling by um, making that connection. You um, talked about the fact that um, she lost family in the Holocaust, but she was very much a fighter and uh, an optimist and a connector prior to that time. What was the crucible that formed her and made her this person who was so concerned for those who were in need and left out and and uh, in, in need of basically shelter, employment, um, and against the greater forces that were mitigating against that. She um, she was uh, a proud Jewish woman. Uh, that's not to say that she was in any way religious because she grew up entirely without religion. She um, recited the verses of Schiller and not the Psalms. She really didn't know much about her religion at all. She did not speak Yiddish. Um, but she, I think it inherited from her mother a, a Jewish sort of, um, talent for hospitality. Her mother uh, was in this provincial town. She had hoped to be an opera singer and had, had her, dopes, her hopes dashed. And so she was um, sort of, you know, had, had reconciled herself to living in this kind of provincial town. But uh, in order to kind of make things better for herself, she opened up her house to everyone, to soldiers from the garrison, to beggars who needed food, to um, people from the local university who might want to, you know, spend time at her house and she had these similar sort of open houses which was a tradition in Europe among many different kinds of people and I think Salka paid very close attention to her mother's uh, gift for hospitality and for compassion for all of the beggars who came to their house. Salka writes about it very um, um, uh, vibrantly in her memoir about how there was always a pot of soup on the stove for people who, who were in need um, whether they were soldiers or or beggars, or, or or any kind of people. So, um, I'm not saying that, that this is you know something that only the Jewish religion um, sees as a core value, but it certainly was um, in Salka's life. And so, uh, that's where I think she got her her mission to um, to be a productive and useful and helpful member to those who did not have as many um, advantages as she had. Mm -hmm. I love the story in the book about how she was always picking up hitchhikers and you mentioned the pot of soup that she kept one on the stove as well mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah. to take care of people. Right. right. I have a number of questions um, that circle around Queen Christina. Um, but the, the first one I wanted to ask you about was she, she was, you mentioned she's a negotiator and was very diplomatic, but what temerity when she meets so, Thalberg for the first time on the MGM lot after that initial meeting. Would you tell that story? Because her audacity was remarkable. So Garbo actually took Salka to Thalberg's house before she even stepped onto the MGM lot. She didn't tell Salka that she was taking her there, but she took him after Salka had written the original screenplay for Queen Christina. And uh, 
she, they had a, a little bit of an introduction and it did not go well. Um, Salka wanted to retain the collaborator, the, the colleague uh, that she had written the, the treatment with and Thalberg was not happy about that. And he was going to be a very, he was gonna drive a hard bargain. He could see, uh, Salka could see as far as giving her um, you know, any kind of leeway uh, with this film. Uh, and so then Garbo, uh, after introducing them, went off on a long vacation to Sweden. And uh, it was up to Salka to go to MGM and negotiate her own contract um, without the help of Garbo, which was daunting for her. She had never done anything like that. So she took Garbo's agent with her and she went to Thalberg's office and he told her that they'd had a bit of a rough start, but that he really was hoping that, you know, they could, they could um, come to some kind of agreement. And they haggled a bit about price and uh, uh, Salka uh, decided that she wasn't going to go along with it. And she took the agent with her and she sort of huffily left, um, left the office. And then she heard again from Thalberg that he um, wanted to continue negotiating with her. And so they were able to reach an agreement where um, finally she was put on staff at MGM as a sort of what was known as a Garbo specialist. And uh, it, it, she ended up uh, after that rough start really liking Thalberg, especially when um, Thalberg was no longer, um, after he died, uh, she had to come in contact with many directors who, uh, and producers who she did not um, respect as much as Thalberg. And she really only came to know his worth, I think after they stopped working together, but he, he loved working with women. He loved working with writers. He was, a, I th think, a bit of a frustrated artist himself. So um, most writers respected him if they didn't especially love him. And that was the case there. Some, some other Queen Christina related questions. Um, would you talk about how the sexual fluidity of the Weimar Republic influenced the pre-code era and Hollywood and in particular how it affected Salka and Garbo's relationship around the Queen Christina project and later the perception of their relationship afterward. So when we're talking about pre-code, we're talking about the period um, in Hollywood before it started policing itself. In other words, before they started um, uh, talking about a production code of morality. Um, there was a time during the Weimar era in Germany when um, in Hollywood, movies were very freewheeling about sexuality, about all kinds of things. Uh, they were very progressive politically. And Queen Christina falls um, squarely in that period. So actually at that first meeting with Thalberg, he uh, had said to Salka, he had asked her whether she had seen a film called Mädchen in Uniform, which was a very popular um, German film by someone Salka had actually known uh, during her acting years in Europe. And uh, in it is a lesbian scene. Um, well, it's a, it's a movie about a, a schoolgirl who falls in love with her teacher and their lesbian relationship. And there, there's a, a point where they share a kiss. And Thalberg asked whether Salka had seen it. And she said, absolutely, she had. And Thalberg said, well, I think that that might um, be an interesting model for Queen Christina and it could um, lead to some interesting scenes. And so at that point, Salka decided she liked Thalberg very much because he was open to this sort of progressive Weimar sensibility that she had come from. Um, but in fact, it was more a business uh, idea of Thalberg's. He was much more interested in the fact that um, European sophistication about sexuality was very attractive to American audiences at the time. And he saw that Mädchen in uniform had made a lot of money at the box office and he thought, okay, let's replicate that. So for him, it was more of a business decision. For Salka, it was an artistic decision. And in fact, when you see Queen Christina, you see almost exactly the kiss between um, Garbo as Queen Christina and her lady-in-waiting is almost identical to the scene in Mädchen in Uniform, as are several other scenes. Um, so Salka was able to get those, um, you know, those sensibilities into the movie. I think much to the credit of the movie when you see it, because um, it's a movie about a queen who is raised to um, act like a king. So there's a lot of very fluid sexuality in it. Garbo pretends to be a man throughout a lot of the movie. Um, her affair with this uh, Spanish ambassador, which was completely made up, but made for some great scenes is pretty, um, you know, ribald in its time. So 
uh, it, it was, I think, uh, an example of how European sophistication made American films better. American films at the time were technologically very sophisticated, but they didn't have a lot of great ideas. And I think people like Salka brought and Ernst Lubitsch and many of these, um, you know, German emigres in, in, uh, brought a lot of um, this kind of sophistication to uh, American films. Um, as f now, what was the second part of the question? Was well, it about just sort of it flowed into the the perception of their possible relationship? Yes. Relationship. So, if anyone knows anything about Salka Viertel these days, it's that the rumor that she and Garbo had a sexual relationship, and I was not able to find any uh, any sort of you know corroboration either way. So it's quite possible that they did because they both came out of this Weimar culture. They, you know, both were very open to open sexuality. Um, it's just as possible that they did not. Salka herself identified as heterosexual and has always strenuously objected to any intimation that they had had a sexual relationship. Personally, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. I think Salka would have done anything for Garbo that she required. They were, that was the kind of friendship that they had. And if there was a physical manifestation, okay, maybe so. It's not the most important thing about them. And I often wonder why people are so interested in that, uh, what it says about the person who asked the question rather than the people who uh, they're asking it about. Because uh, often at the time in Hollywood and, and even up to our day, the first way to ruin somebody's reputation was to accuse them of homosexuality. And that happened with F.W. Murnau, it happened with many people in Hollywood at the time. So people might have felt in the film industry, here was Salka, this authoritative, very confident woman, this emigre who was you know, sort of horning in on their territory, let's accuse her of being homosexual and try to get rid of her. Um, a lot of times that, that may have been what was behind these rumors. Did they work? Uh, no, I, I would say, no, they didn't really work. Um, you know, Salka was was pretty successful and was able to sort of bat them away. She was um, successful enough and talented enough that this, the studio was going to use you until they couldn't use you anymore. And so, you know, you could say anything you wanted about someone, but if you were of use to them, if you were a Garbo specialist or their biggest star, they were gonna keep you on. And that's what they did. Understandable. Can you talk a bit about Salka and Garbo's relationship just in terms of the psychology of what made them similar and drew them to one another? Mm. They weren't similar at all. They were opposites. Garbo was... <laughs> what made them opposites then <laughs> and yeah. drew them to one another? That's exactly right. I think that the opposites attracted in this way. Garbo was a very shy, reclusive, well, I wouldn't say reclusive. I mean, there's this this image of her as a sort of Sunset Boulevard character who always wanted to be alone, and that's not exactly true. She uh, she had many friends. She you know had a social life. She didn't spend a lot of time at Salka's Sunday afternoons because she didn't really want a lot of attention focused on her on her day off. But she uh, would come to dinner parties at Salka's house all the time, and she she had grown up uh, miserably poor, and in in a tenement house in Sweden, and suddenly was thrust into this world of celebrity. She was one of the, really the biggest, earliest celebrities Hollywood has, had ever known and had a fear of crowds and a bit of agoraphobia. And so uh, she really needed someone to sort of um, negotiate between her adoring public and her need to sort of, you know, be on her, more or less on her own. So that was, that was the role Salka played. Salka was very extroverted and, um, had an opposite sort of personality. Um, and she uh, often, uh, Garbo would use Salka's address as her own. In fact, when she applied for citizenship, she gave Salka's address as her own. Um, so she thought of, of Salka's house as a, a refuge, a place she could be safe from all these crowds of fans and where she could be herself and didn't have to be you know, the great glamorous um, movie queen. She could just be because she was really rather a simple person. She liked to garden, she liked to be outside, she liked to hike and, and swim and um, climb Salka's fig tree. She didn't, uh, she, she gave this air of sort of mysterious, you know, queendom, which Queen Christina sort of cemented in the, in the public imagination, but she herself was um, a quiet, more of a quiet person. Can you talk a bit about the fascination with royalty back then? And I guess it's pervasive now, but you mentioned that, or you highlight how in the 30s, 
Dietrich was playing Catherine the Great and Colbert was playing Cleopatra. And there were a number of, of, of roles of queens and kings and that sort of thing. Betty Davis playing Queen Elizabeth. Was it, are we at, in, in a similar time now with our fas fascination with royalty as they were back then? I think that's a fascinating parallel because I'm noticing now, you know, we have a Catherine the Great series on TV right now. There's lots of interest in royalty. And I think for maybe for many of the same reasons, those movies were being made in the height of the depression. And I think uh, moviegoers were starved for images of glamor and of you know royalty and celebrity and glittery jewels and um, you know great castles. Certainly Queen Christina falls into that. It's 1932, 33. Um, the you know moviegoers couldn't get enough of things like that, and I think maybe that something similar could be going on today with our fashion fascination with royalty. That um, you know, if, if you're struggling to make a living, you know, you kind of want to see um, uh, images of glamour and of of power um, that aren't available to you. Um, so, possibly, I don't know. A question about um, how she ends up sort of disappearing because she had so many of these friends who were emigres and helped so many careers, and yet people ignored her in their autobiographies and their memoirs. I'm thinking of Thomas Mann and um, Brecht was another. Chaplin gives her one line in his biography. But such a towering figure, how could she just disappear? that way? Well, I think, you know, it's that old line that the winners write the history books. So most of the people writing uh, the histories of Hollywood were men, and they didn't really uh, pay attention to women's contributions. Although women were active in every corner of the film industry, they were not considered, um, you know, powerful or influential enough to pay attention to. As far as her own friends, it was baffling to me that Thomas Mann uh, talks about her throughout his diaries, but only about the excellent coffee she served, or the wonderful chocolate cake that he was obsessed with, and never really about her, um, her personality, her influence, her, um, you know, sort of connecting talents. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that it infuriated me because I felt here is this person who, in both, in both of these sort of aspects of her life, in Hollywood and in the anti-fascist um, crusade. She, she did so much. And then, as you say, she just faded away because nobody really thought her worthy of any kind of attention. And, and if, if she survives at all in the, in the imagination of people, it's, it's really just as a sort of adjunct to Garbo. And she herself, I think, is such a more interesting person than Garbo, who is a great actress, but did not engage in the same way in her, with a fierceness in her life that, that Salka Fiertel did. Some questions from the audience. Um, somebody asked, how did her relationship with her, her husband evolve over the years in the US and did he continue to find work also? And finally, you mentioned she was needy at the end. What happened? Uh, Salka and her husband were, uh, had a very complicated marriage. Um, I think it's a very successful marriage, but uh, you could read it otherwise. They early on realized that they were not going to be sexually faithful to each other. So um, they both embarked on many um, extramarital affairs. But at the same time, they had an ironclad dedication to each other. They understood each other's work and supported each other's work um, in a really deep way. They were you know, fanatically devoted to the welfare of their three children throughout their lives. Berthold found himself less and less able to um, survive in Hollywood. And during the war, uh, he was away from home many times. He would go to New York to put on a play or you know, many plays during the war. He spent less and less time in Hollywood. And as soon as the war was over, he went back to um, his hometown of Vienna where he uh, was directing for uh, the, the state theater there. He, at the time, he, um, Salka many, many, during many of these decades asked him, let's just get a divorce. Why don't, why are we still together? And he absolutely refused. He said, no, I know that we're going to grow old together. We're going to die together. He refused. But when he went back to Vienna, it turned out that his um, very close 
paramour, and he could not live together without uh, benefit of marriage, according to the, the sort of edicts of the state theater. So he finally said to Salka, let's get a divorce, and they did. And But they remained close for the rest of his life. And there's a sort of harrowing moment in my book where Salka wants to go see him on his, what turned out to be his deathbed. She was gonna fly to see him. And because her passport had been taken away and she was sort of being hounded by um, the FBI, she was not able to leave and see him at the end of his life, which was a very great, um, terrible situation for her. Um, I'm sorry, there was a second part to that that I don't remember. Well, it was the fact that you had mentioned she was needy at the end and the yes. question so, was right, what happened. She, uh, you know, her film work dried up. She kept trying. She never stopped trying to make movies. And Garbo herself, you know, people say, oh, she, after Two-Faced Woman, she retired. She never wanted to make a movie again. That wasn't true. There were many, many attempts by Salka and Garbo to get films off the ground, but because they no longer had the sort of institutional machinery of MGM behind them, it was a much more difficult proposition. You know, they had to work with independent producers and, and they all fell through for one reason or another, which is why Garbo never made another film. Salka though, wrote, actually wrote two movies when she went back to Europe that she has credits on and she did television work. She had several credits in, on TV. She, um, but she was an older woman and people as I said before, just didn't think her worthy or of any interest. And the, the work just completely dried up after a while. And she that's when she settled down to write her memoir. She thought, well, she had always worked. And so the idea of not working was anathema to her. She, in fact, she said of Garbo, you know, work is a habit and she lost it because Garbo never needed to work again. She had a ton of money. Salka had no money. She had given all her money away. She was the most generous, um, ter most terrible business person you can imagine because it all just sort of fell out of her pockets into the hands of anyone who needed it. So she was at the end of her life. It made me ask, you know, she had cooked for all these people and, and put them up in her house. Who was putting her up? Who was cooking for her? And it, it was heartbreaking to me that she didn't get to enjoy the same kind of hospitality that she had offered to so many people. If she had had the temerity to ask, and she certainly had temerity, would people have helped? I mean, you think of all these people she helped who had so many resources and was was it pride? Was it? Yeah, I think it was a lot of pride. Uh, she did, some people did help. I mean, her son, Peter, was extremely good to her and was supporting, more or less supporting her. Garbo herself tried to intervene. When she came to Switzerland, she would buy Salka some furniture or a hot plate or a few things, but. But I think it was a lot of it was pride that she had made all this money and was was this sort of, you know, she was supporting her family for all these years as well as all these other people. And the idea that she could no longer do it, you know, she had when she went to visit Charlie Chaplin in the neighboring Swiss town where he was living, she had to borrow, you know, a little bit of money to take the train home. And that was humiliating, extremely humiliating for such a proud person. Yeah, no, the, the fact that he, she, she, if I remember correctly, she borrowed it from Chaplin's daughter. No, his wife, Una. Oh, the wife to take the taxi ride home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, can you leave us with a favorite story that perhaps is more ebullient to carry us off? <laughs> <laughs> on the lighter side, on the lighter side. Of, uh, well, let's see. Um, there was a moment when um, Bertold, her husband, had gone back to Europe, I believe this is before the war, and his youngest son, Tommy, who loved Berthold and became a poet actually in, in I think to honor his father, the poet, he wrote, I, I saw this in the archives in Germany where Salka's papers are, um, Salka and Berthold's papers are. Um, he wrote in all block letters, he was learning to write in English and he wrote, um, our dog, uh, is we, we call our dog an English upsetter because he ate the neighbor's rabbits. <laughs> so when you see this, it's just a, such an adorable little, you know, sort of missive from a little kid to his father trying to, you know, understand the sort of puns in the English language at such a young age. I thought that was really cute. Well, that's adorable. It works. Um, Donna, thank you so much for your time, for your presentation this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is beautifully written. It's called The Sun and Her Stars. You can use the link at the bottom of the screen there to purchase it. Um, Donna, thanks so much again. Everybody, keep reading, stay safe, be well, and have a good night. Thank you.